If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, would you grab them? We're going to be in John chapter 11 in our time together. If you are a first-time guest here, I would love to invite you back next week uh, when the real preacher from Rooted will be here. John chapter 11, I'm here to share with you that it's not over until Jesus says it's over. It's not over until Jesus says it's over. Some of you show up here today and you think your marriage is over. And I'm here to tell you, it's not over until Jesus says it's over. I mean, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. If God can breathe new life into his dead son, then he could breathe new life into your marriage. Amen? Amen. Some of you got a scan or a report from the doctor this week. And though we love and appreciate when God heals through doctors and medicine and technology, doctors don't get the last word. Jesus gets the last word. It's not over till Jesus says it's over. And some of you think that you are too far gone for God to reach you. And I'm here to tell you that it's not over until Jesus says it's over. That's what we're going to see here in John chapter 11. Spoiler alert, in case you're new to Bible study, Lazarus is going to come out of the grave. Amen? We're just going to go verse by verse, walk right through this and see what God has to say for us today. It is an incredible honor for me to be here. I mean, when we were, I got emotional while we were singing, man, because it's one thing um, in your own country to hear the words of Revelation 7, that every tribe, tongue, and nation will be gathered around his throne. You realize the only thing that you and I have in common is Jesus, right? And here we are together. And just my two cents on the singing, I like the Zulu songs better than I like the the English songs, okay? (laughs) When you did that, I thought, boy, we are in the third heaven right now, Okay. That was incredible. All right, here we go. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, this hasn't happened yet. This happens in John chapter 12. But but John is going to write this as an old man looking back in time, looking through the empty cross, looking through the empty tomb, through the cross, and he is going to to talk about things that have already happened here. What's going to happen in John chapter 12 is Mary and Martha and Lazarus are going to gather together at Simon the leper's house is what he's called, but a leper can't have a party. So this means, I don't know why it is that we like to identify people by their issues and their past and their pain. Aren't you glad that we don't identify you by your pain, by your condition? Or how about the woman in Capernaum? She's known as the woman with the issue of blood. How come she's not known as the woman who has been healed by Jesus? How come it's not Simon the used to be leper's house? And what they're going to do is they're going to gather together in John chapter 12 at Simon the leper's house. And here's the thing, man. He's never been able to throw a party. He couldn't touch food. He couldn't handle food. He couldn't be around people or they would be unclean also. And they're going to get together at this man who used to be a leper and now is healed. And they're going to have a big gratitude party. That's what church ought to be. Welcome to Simon the Leper's house. This is where a bunch of people that used to be lame, used to be blind, used to be leprous, used to be isolated, have been transformed by the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then we just get together to bust open the ointment. It changes the atmosphere and make much of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I think the reason that John puts this in here is he wants us to know the close, intimate relationship that Mary and Martha and Jesus have. You see, Jesus used to stop by this house as like a rest stop to do ministry. This is where he would hang out. He would have what we call in the States refrigerator rights. Do you have friends with refrigerator rights? These are the people that don't knock on your door. They just walk in your house. And they don't ask where the tea is. They just go and get it. This is what Jesus was like with this family. He also knew that Mary loved to listen and Martha loved to cook. And by the way, that's what every man is looking for. You find somebody that can cook and listen, you're going to hang out at their house. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, I'm going to imagine that Martha puts this note together. We find out in Luke chapter 10 that Martha is a driven person. She gets it done. She's the kind of woman that can't go to sleep if there's still dishes in the sink. Know anybody like that? 
I'm married to one, okay? And so she is just driven, driven, driven. And I know that she's thinking, all right, my brother is ill, but we know Jesus. We're good friends with Jesus. Surely he can come and do something about it. So she sends a note. She can't text, can't DM. So she puts a note together and she doesn't say, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. She says, Jesus, the one whom you love is ill. Now here are two things that are true according to this text. One, Jesus loves Lazarus. Fact. Two, Lazarus is sick. True. Both can be true at the same time. There are so many people that think if God loves me that he would never let me go through pain. Let me ask you this. What do you do when you are going through pain? The first thing that these sisters think is the first response is we need to bring this to Jesus. I mean, let me ask you, is prayer for you a last resort or a first response? What is the first thing that you do every day when you wake up? Now, don't answer out loud. You embarrass yourself in church. Because I know what for many people it is. For many people, the first thing we do is we pick up this thing. And we go to see what the rest of the world thinks about us instead of going to the one who can actually change the world that we live in. If you have a tendency to look at your phone first thing instead of look to the king of kings first thing, let me encourage you with a little brotherly exhortation. Take this thing and throw it deep up under your bed so that every morning when you wake up, you got to get down on your knees and go find your phone. And maybe while you're down there, you could pray to the king of kings and you could lift up your prayer request to him. Amen? So her first response is we need to tell Jesus about this. Verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, He said, this illness does not lead to death. And it does lead to death. It just leads through death and out the other side. Then he says, it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You see, how many of you know that maybe the miracle that you're looking for is on the other side of the valley of the shadow of death? I mean, Jesus, the good shepherd, he doesn't say that he waits on the other end of the... valley of the shadow of death and goes, come on, as soon as you make it through, I'll be here. He never promises that he would pick us up and levitate us over the valley of the shadow of death. He says that we should fear no evil, not because there's not evil to be feared, but though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for he is with us, that he is with us in the pain. And again, maybe the miracle that you're looking for is on the other side of the pain. Now, one of the questions that I get asked as a pastor all the time is this, if God is good and God is in control and God is all powerful, then why do we suffer pain if we are believers? Well, there's one of five reasons that we go through pain, that we go through trials. Sometimes it's just the fact that we live in a fallen world, that when sin entered the world, it held the door open for pain and for tragedy. And sometimes it's just a broken world. Everything from broken weather systems to sometimes cells don't do what they're supposed to do. Sometimes, sometimes the reason that we go through pain is it's demonic attack, specific demonic attack. Now, there are times when I bring up demonic attack in our church and I've got folks in my church that say, Pastor, you mean to tell us in 2023, you still believe in the demonic? And you don't? What do you think is wrong with this world? Just poor decision making? Because I'm telling you, man, it's like when I go hunting. You realize that, that one, of, one of the devil's favorite schemes is for you to not know that he's there. It's funny, in America, they call hunting a sport. I think it's hilarious. You know why? Half the teams playing don't know we're playing the game. You know what I mean? <laughs> You ever met a person with an addiction? Somebody that doesn't want to do the things that they're doing. Somebody that doesn't want to walk down that road anymore. And they've promised and promised and promised, this is my last time. I'm never going to take it again. I'm never going to drink it again. I'm never going to smoke it again. And yet there's this thing in them that wants to lead them to death and destruction. That's not what you want to call that. Yeah, sometimes the enemy is attacking you. Sometimes the reason that you go through pain... Is because of you. Sometimes it's your own sin. I had a lady in my church come to me and say, Pastor, the devil is attacking me and my vocation. Okay, darling, tell me about it a little bit. She begins to talk to me about her job. And I go, well, I got good news and bad news. You're right, the devil is attacking you. Problem is, you're the devil. 
you didn't get fired from your job because of the devil. It's because you don't get up and go to work. You get there late. You don't do a good job. Yeah, sometimes God will just turn you over to yourself. And that's the reason that you're walking through pain. Sometimes it's not because of your sin. Sometimes it's because of other sin against you. And the fifth one is this. Sometimes it's just a test from God. I'm, and, and no matter where it comes from, no matter the source, Romans 8, 28 still holds true. That God is at work in all things for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, in the, in the Greek there, the things are not, that's not the subject of the sentence. God is the initiator of the sentence. God does not play second fiddle. God does not drive an ambulance, driving around this world trying to fix all the problems. That God is in control and he can use even our own sin, other sin. He can use our own pain as a platform to display the goodness of God. I mean, look at Joseph in the Old Testament. There was domestic violence. There was human trafficking. There was all kind of evil that had happened against him. But when he finds himself elevated to the place that God had for him, he looks at his brothers, though he had the power to have revenge on them. He says, am I not in the place that God would have for me? And here's what he said. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. People mistranslate that. He does not say what you intended for evil, God used for good. No, 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 no. That God is in control of all things. And so Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You see, the deeper the pain, the greater the platform. Exhibit A, the cross. If you were standing at the foot of the cross, not knowing what we know now, I mean, we have the advantage of being post-resurrection Christians, and we saw the Son of God nailed to a tree saying, it is finished, and breathing his last, we would think, God, what are you doing? Have you completely lost control? And God would say, just give it three days. I'm redeeming the world. He still got the whole world in his hands. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. In fact, Lazarus' name means God is my help. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, now don't look at your Bibles, look at me. If you didn't know this story, what would you think was going to happen? Jesus loved Mary. Jesus loved Martha. Jesus loved Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, you would think that it would say he would throw some miracle dust from wherever he was and Lazarus would be healed and revival would break out in Bethany. That is not what it says. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Wait, what? You see, apparently God's love and cooperation are not related. Have you ever noticed that God's timing and our timing are just not the same? I mean, but he's never late. I've never experienced him to be early either. God's just on his own timing. You ever notice God is not in a hurry? God's never been in a hurry. I'm always in a hurry. In fact, I never pray for patience. I pray you people would hurry up. That's what I pray for. I'm mostly talking about my family, but that's okay. And apparently God does not mind that we suffer temporary pain if that brings us to a God-glorifying end. Amen? I mean, think about this. When God created all things, in Genesis 1 and 2, he spoke them into existence. Why does he take six days? He could have done it in one word. Everything. Everything is there. But that's not what he does. There's a rhythm to it. And the Bible says that the day, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day with the Lord. And so Jesus, when he hears that Lazarus is sick, he just hangs out for two days. Let me ask you this. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like you're praying and praying and praying and praying and God's just not answering your prayers? You ever feel like giving up on praying? I know you never say it in here, but you know what I mean. Like your, like your marriage is busted up? And you hear these stories about God blessing these marriages, and you're like, God, why not mine? You got a prodigal son or daughter, and you're praying, Lord, won't, won't you let them come home? Because listen, man, there ain't no pain like kid pain, amen? 
There's no pain like kid pain. You let your kid be sick and you're like, Lord, how about, how about heal my child? Or you've been, you've been praying for that lost person that you love like crazy. God, just save them. I mean, some of them, you're praying for your husbands to come to Christ right now. They're not here today. They're doing something dumb. They're playing golf or I don't know what they're doing. They're not even good at it. They lie at the school. <laughs> And then, and then you go to, you go to Bible study and, and ask, hey, how's your week going? And there's one girl in your group, she's like, oh, the Lord has just blessed me this week. I was going to the mall and prayed for an upfront spot and he gave me a parking spot. And you're like, Lord, are you serious right now? I'm praying for salvation for my lost spouse and you're giving Tammy parking spots? Are we serious? I would just say, hang in there, man. You may be in that two day waiting period. And, and, and the Lord is not slow. He's not. He has perfect timing. I, I lead a church that has, we've had over 10,000 people profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior for the first time. And yet I'd been praying for my dad for 30 years. And for whatever reason, every time I would try to share the gospel, to which I'd think, I'm really good at this. God uses me all the time with strangers I've never even prayed for, just random people. I don't know these people. And I prayed for my daddy. for It took him 30 years. And then two years ago, my dad saved me. So what? Oh my God saved my dad. So whatever you do, don't ever, ever, ever stop praying. And here's why. Here's we sang it, man. I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews, and when the Bible says the Jews, it means like the religious leaders. The Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? They're like, Jesus, are you sure? You ever double check the plans of the Lord? Are you sure you want to do this? I don't know if you understand the situation going on around here, but let me inform you about what's happening. And Jesus answered, <clears throat> I love this. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, does that help anybody? I think the disciples are like, mm, mm. Now, you're a very responsive crowd. My crowd in America, see, when white people in America don't know how to say amen, right? They moo like a cow. Like when the pastor says something good, they go, mmm, mmm. And the more confusing you are, the more that they move. That's what they think. So I think what's happening here is he says this, and the disciples are like, mmm, oh, that's so good. Oh, Rabbi, so deep. Matthew leans over to Thomas. Hey, what did he mean there? He goes, mmm, I have no idea. But the, but, the, but the more confused I am, the deeper it must be. They're tweeting, praise hands, praise hands, fire, fire. Mm, so good. <clears throat> Basically, Jesus is saying, as long as I'm here, we got work to do. That's all he's saying. And after saying these things, he says to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go to awaken him. <laughs> and the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. You ever try to explain how things on earth work to God? They're trying to explain how naps work. You ever do that, Lord? There's this thing called the stock market. If you could turn it green this week, I'd really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Here, here's why this is good news. You ever a little slow on the uptake on the whole Bible study thing? Pastor Oney up here is slinging it and it's going shoot right over your head. And you're so confused, I've got really good news. You could make a great disciple. If you read through the four Gospels, the disciples, they understood basically nothing. They didn't even, they were most surprised about the resurrection. It's the thing Jesus talked about over and over. He goes, all right, everybody write this down. I'm going to be, I'm going to be arrested, tried, crucified, dead, buried, and on the third day be resurrected from the grave. And where are they on the third day? Where'd he go? Okay, well, zoom, right over their head. And God used these knuckleheads to turn the world upside down. It should make you feel much better about your discipleship, amen? amen. And so, <clears throat> after Jesus says, all right, as long as we got work to do, okay? Now Jesus has spoken of his death, 
But they thought that he meant it was taking rest and sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. That you may believe. Jesus is saying, Lazarus is sick. I know I could heal him. I wasn't there and he died. And I'm glad that he died. Why? So that you may believe. Listen, disciple, my prayer for you is that God would bless you or break you whatever it takes to draw you to him because it's worth it. No matter what the pain is, no matter what the trial is. J.I. Packer says it this way, and still he seeks the fellowship of his people and brings them both joy and sorrow to detach our hands from the things of this world that we might grab onto him so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And so Thomas called the twin. By the way, this is Doubting Thomas. He said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Which, by the way, this is a pretty good definition of what discipleship is. Discipleship over time is come and see turns into come and die. I think Thomas gets the worst nickname in the whole Bible. Doubting Thomas? I think he was surprised when we get to heaven and say, oh, you're Doubting Thomas. He said, no, no, no. I'm like Thomas the brave, Thomas to die, you know, ready to die. In fact, John is called the disciple that Jesus loves. You know where the only book of the Bible he's called that in? John, written by John. Okay, so you don't get to give your own nickname, okay? Verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. I think the reason is because in the first century, there was a legend that your spirit could hover around for three days. But by the fourth day, Everybody knows that you're dead, dead. You're all the way dead. You're not like Princess Bride dead, sort of dead. You were all the way dead. So he is all the way dead. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Do you know why this is in here? Because Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two, two miles off. That this is historical fact. This isn't, a, this isn't a myth. This isn't far, far away and a long time ago. That's not what this is. This is not a made-up thing. You could go to Lazarus' house. It's not a fairy tale. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now, it was customary in the first century that a whole bunch of people would show up and a funeral service would not just be like one or two hours long. It would often be a week long. You could actually contract whalers in the first century if you didn't think you had enough people that would miss your loved one. You could contract them to show up and they would go to the graveside you when, whenever you wanted to cry and they would wail and cry with you. I, I don't know what funeral services are like here. Different cultures have all kind of different traditions. In fact, the first uh, funeral I ever did, I graduated seminary <clears throat> and uh on the last day of seminary, they give you this little black book, and it's like a cheater book for all the things that you do. Marriages, baptisms, house blessings, funeral, all this kind of stuff. And so the church that I worked at was a few hundred people. There was only a couple of pastors on staff. And the senior pastor had made a deal with the county that if anybody needed a funeral in the county but didn't have a church, we would do the funeral. It was like a service to the community. It was an outreach kind of thing. Well, when I got hired, I got hired in the summer and it was a holiday and everybody was on vacation but me. So we get the call. Will y'all do the funeral? I was like, of course I will. They said it's graveside only. So I don't have to do the whole thing at church and do a eulogy about a person I don't know. All I got to do is show up at the graveside. And I thought this will be easy. I'll get my little black book. I'll turn to funeral, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, read the thing. It'll be fine. Okay. So I show up to the funeral and it's a completely different culture than the culture that I grew up in. Everybody is dressed to the nines. I mean, they've like three-piece suits. All the women's have big hats. They got gloves to their biceps. I don't know how y'all do it here, but they roll out this little putting green thing in America where everybody sits on the thing right by the by the casket, and there's a little tent that you're supposed to sit under. And it's it's Virginia in July. For us, it was about a hundred degrees. So it was so hot. I mean so hot. So I roll up looking different than everybody else, walk up, say hey to everybody. Now, the man that passed away was a veteran. And so in America, oftentimes to honor our veterans, there'll be a flag over the casket. And then the honor guard from the VHW, some like retired military folks will come and play taps and then do a little three-gun salute. And it's pretty cool. Well, this wasn't the most polished honor guard I had ever seen in my life. This was in the mountains of Virginia. And so we show up and they have this thing called a boom box. 
Some of y'all gonna have to Google boombox. You don't even know what it was. And nobody could play the trumpet or the bugle, so they had it on a cassette tape. And somebody had forgotten to rewind the cassette tape. Think about it. Some of y'all don't even know what rewind is. So these three old men with these rifles are there, and they hit it, and it's in the middle of it, and they back it up, back it up. They finally get it to the beginning. So they play it on this kind of wobbly-sounding cassette tape. And then they're going to do the three-gun salute. Ready, aim, fire, pop, pop. It's supposed to all be at once. They weren't that good. On the second shot, again, it's 100 degrees. The widow is sitting there, white gloves up to here, big hat, big old dress. She is, uh, I mean, she's fearfully and wonderfully made, but there's a lot of wonderful going on. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Sitting on these little dinky plastic chairs, and I don't know if she got hot. I don't know if the chair gave way. I'm not exactly sure what happened. But on the second shot, ready, aim, fire, pow, she hits her back. Boom. (laughs) And somebody screams out, oh, Lord, they done shot Nana, okay? (laughs) And it's over, man. And I'm up here, 23 years old, don't know what to do, going, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, I don't know, okay, so. So there's all kind of different cultures. And when they would go and wail and cry, the whole, all these people would go and wail and cry with them. And so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to him But Mary remained seated at the house. What I want you to see here is I want you to see in a time of pain how Jesus responds to these two different women. And even though they're sisters, they're they're complete opposites. I mean, don't you know the same two parents can give birth to different kids and they're completely different human beings? Again, man, Mary is a Mary is an introvert. Mary is quiet. When, when they invite Jesus over, she's sitting crisscross applesauce in front of him, just wants to spend time with him. While Martha is a type A driven, get it done kind of girl. And so here's what happens. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Now, you ever been there? You ever go to God and say, Lord, what are you doing? I mean, God, I've got this whole thing figured out. I've, I've, I've got a plan. If you would just stick to my plan, everything would be fine. And again, I'm not asking for cash and prizes here. I'm not asking for cotton candy and, and new cars. I'm just asking that you would keep my brother alive whom you love. God, what are you doing? Because I know you can do miracles. I mean, Lord, I heard one time that you hear, healed a woman in, in, in Capernaum by accident. I mean, you're just walking around, somebody touched me. Who got me? I felt power go out for me. So if you can cure her and you didn't mean to, then can't you just do the thing that I'm asking you to do? You ever been there? Is it okay to come to the Lord and ask these kind of questions? God, what are you doing? Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And he means like right now, like in 30 minutes or so. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she has very good doctrine, which matters. You can't rightly love God without right thoughts about God. That's why the songs you sing matter. That's why the word that is preached matters. Like if I go home and I were to write my wife a love song, and the first line was about her beautiful red hair, she would not like it because she ain't got red hair. She would think, I think you're singing to somebody else. So she, she's got right doctrine. <clears throat> and then Jesus is going to redefine what resurrection is. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then ask this very important question. Do you believe this? And he is redefining resurrection. He's redefining what heaven is. He's saying, listen, heaven is not just a place you go. Now, heaven is a place, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. But what makes heaven heaven is not streets of gold and banqueting tables. What makes heaven heaven is you get Jesus. And he is the resurrection and he is the life. And when he says this, seven times in the book of John, he makes these I am statements. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. 
And what he is saying to them is, I am completely God. The, the covenant name for God in the Old Testament is Yahweh. Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. It is translated, I am that I am. God gives this name to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush. It is supposed to sound like breathing. Yahweh, breathe in, breathe out. That the breath you have is from God and God is as close as your next breath. It is translated again, I am that I am or I be what I be. Here's what it means, that he is the eternal present. This is why, this is why the, the, the elders and the angels in heaven are constantly singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Why? Because there is no past or present or future for God. It is the eternal now. And that's what he is saying. I am the resurrection and the life. Colossians chapter 1 say that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. That word firstborn doesn't mean what we think it means. The Greek word is prototoko. Say prototoko. This is where we get the English word prototype. You know what a prototype is? So this last year, I had the opportunity to go to Matthew's Bow Shop. I don't, you might not know what it is. There's a guy named Matt McPherson lives in the States. He makes Matthew bows that you hunt with. He loves the Lord. He's got one line of bows called Mission, and all the money that he makes from that bow, he gives the missionaries. So every time I buy a new bow, I tell my wife, baby, it's basically like tithing. Amen. Let's go. <laughs> so <clears throat> we go into the factory, and he had the new prototype that hadn't come out yet. And so what you do with a prototype is you run it through all the tests, you run it through all of the, the, the things to make sure it works exactly the way it's supposed to work. And the moment it works the way it's supposed to work, then you go from prototype to mass production. Yeah. Jesus is the prototype from among the dead. That Jesus stepped off of his throne, came down as a baby, grows up to be a man, lives a perfect life, never sins, fulfills every promise and prophecy of the Lord, goes to the cross. Not only does he die for us, he dies instead of us. And God made him who was without sin to be sin for us, that we would be made the righteousness of God. He pushes up on his nail-pierced feet and he says, it is finished. And anyone but that believes that that counted for you, then you are reconciled to the almighty God. He is dead and buried and three days later is resurrected resurrected from the grave because the wages of sin is death. He's got no sin, so death can't hold him. He puts death to death and walks out of the grave. And if he walks out of the grave, you can do some walking too. And therefore he was the firstborn, the prototype, and it worked. Therefore you and I are the mass production of who Christ is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? I would ask you, do you believe this? Now, he, she could have thought he meant, do you believe that I can change your circumstances? But that's not where she goes. She believes that he is who he says he is. And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now, here's what I want you to see here. Type A, driven, doctrinally minded Martha is comforted by this deep theological discussion and dissertation on the fact that the Christ is the resurrection and the life. But she's got a, she's got a sister. She's wired completely different. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and she went to him. Now, I want you to see how differently he deals with her sister. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, so before she speaks a word, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She says the same thing. God, what are you doing? God, what are you doing? I don't understand. I don't understand why you would let my brother die. Let me just ask him, have you ever been there? Like, what do you do when God won't do what you think he ought to do? What I would encourage you with is this. What she does, what she does is she runs and falls at the feet of Jesus Christ. 
Is it okay to question God? Apparently it is, because twice now, both of these sisters ask him the same thing. What are you doing? There's a difference in questioning God in what he is doing and questioning whether he is actually in control. These are fundamentally different questions. I mean, think about it. Psalm 22, verse 1 says this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A thousand years before Jesus would ever quote that on the cross, David writes it in his journal, and the Spirit of God says, That's good, Dave. Why don't you write that down? We're going to keep that one in the Bible forever and ever because my children are going to feel that sometimes. So what do you do when God doesn't do what you think he ought to do? Hmm. You pour out your emotions, you pour out your prayers on the feet of Jesus. Listen, man, about two years ago, I lost my, one of my very best friends. We were on a hunting trip in Scotland. It was incredible. First few days were incredible. We hike up in the highlands to chase red stag around. And we get back that evening, and my friend Bradley didn't make it back. He had a heart attack on the mountain. And of all the people that I would take out, and I've got a long list, Bradley would not be on that. I led Bradley to Christ about 10 years ago. Bradley was a general contractor and built all of our churches, all of our campuses. Loved the Lord like crazy. And yet, somehow, for God's glory, I, I can't even see it on this side of heaven. I was supposed to be on a sabbatical. It was a gift for my church to take some time, to take some rest. All I wanted to do was go to church and be with my church. All I wanted to do was gather together on Sunday mornings. You know why? Because it ain't a show with a little bit of Christian karaoke and a TED talk. That's not what it is. Do you realize that when the saints get together like this to make much of the Lord, this is what the church fathers would call the thin place. Don't ever underestimate what happens in this place. This is where miracles happen, man. This is where chains of addiction falls off. This is where marriages are restored. This is where souls get saved. And all I wanted to do... I had a bunch of my friends lined up to preach because I was off for that time. And, and, and my sabbatical coach said, no, you can't show up to your own church. They'll make you work. And I'm like, dude, what's wrong with you, man? These are my people. These are my ride or die. This is it. I'm with these people till I die. I want to just go to our church and I want to sing the songs. I want to pray the prayers. I want to hear the sermon. And at the end of the sermon, I want to come fall on my face at the prayer area at the feet of Jesus, knowing that he will meet me right there. Amen. Listen, God can handle your honest prayers. Let me say it this way. The fake you's doing just fine. You can leave her on Instagram. But a real Jesus died in a, on a real cross for the real you, and he really wants to hear from you. Listen, man, sometimes, sometimes you need to do some little warm-up prayers. I get it, man. I get it maybe to get you going. But, but if all you ever do is just these, these rote, memorized prayers that don't come from your heart, then you're not actually praying. In America, we grow up with the dumbest prayer in the world. I don't, everybody teaches this. I don't know if it's here or not. But when I was growing up, my mama would pray this with me when we would go to bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. Do you all know this one? I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake. And I went to my mama. I said, Mama, what's if I should die me? She said, what are you talking about? I was like, what? Are we like varsity? We pray in Latin at our house? What are we doing? You know, if I should die before I wake. She's like, no, baby, that's if I should die. And I'm like, good Lord, mama, what is happening in my house that I'm begging God to survive eight hours of sleep? Maybe we should call the police. Now, help me out here. Okay. So <laughs> you see, before you ever need it, you better, you better pour out your heart and soul to the good shepherd so that you can know his tender mercies. So this is what Mary does. And Jesus meets her right where she is. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. The number one, see, feelings are a gift from God. There are no bad feelings. Ecclesiastes 3 says, there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. There's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn. And, and pastoring for 30 years now, what I've learned is the people that don't know how to mourn, then they won't know how to dance when it's time to dance. So, so feelings are a gift from God to navigate this thing we call life, but they make a terrible Lord. But what's interesting, man, is that Jesus is going to, he's going to be deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. Most of the time when the Bible talks about the emotion of Jesus, it uses this word splagizomai that means compassion. That's not this word. This is embryomiomai which greatly troubled means 
emotional indignation. Oftentimes it's used to describe a bull snorting. Here's the thing. Jesus is ticked. He's, you ever get that angry cry? That's what he's doing. And I think the reason is because he's, he's angry at sin. Listen, man. Um, sometimes, we, we just, sometimes, especially men, when it's time to cry, bro, it's time to cry. And I know we all try to avoid it because we think we're tough. You ain't that tough. And so I don't, man, I, I, got, a, I got super emotional while we were worshiping here today. You just got to embrace that. Now, I don't love to cry in front of people because some of you guys cry like a stud. Some of you old heads cry like Thanos, like chin gets big, one tear, bing, not me. I like convulse and I can't breathe and I'm, I'm you know, cry like an eighth grade girl that watched The Notebook. You know, my face turns inside out. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was doing my grandmother's funeral and uh I mean, she was 95 years old. It was sad, but it's not a tragedy. You know what I mean? I mean, she was in Sunday school with like Moses. She's in heaven. It's fine. <laughs> but I had to do the speaking part, and my brother was there with me. My brother's a police officer. He's, he's like, he's a bad dude, man. He wears like body armor and shoots bad guys. He's a bad dude. And so he comes up to me, and he's like, hey, bro, what can I do for you? And I'm like, look, man, it's, you know, it's sad. If I get choked up, I don't want to do it up front. I want to be able to do this in an honorable way. So if I could just look to you on the front row, and if you could just be a rock for me, then that'll get me through. And he's like, okay, okay I got you, dude. And then we did that man hug. You know how that bro hug? Where like you grab hands, and then you reach around like this, and you, I'm a man. You know what I mean? You don't just like hug. You, so your chest don't touch. That's, that's the reason we do that. <clears throat> He's like, I got you, man. I got you. And so I get up there to do my part, and I, I'm Joseph Perry Martin III, named after my dad, who was named after my grandma's husband, right? And so I get up. I'm Joseph Perry Martin III, named after her husband, and I'm the favorite grandchild. It's not even close. And, and then I started feeling that emotion. You know, my voice did that. And I look over to my rock, my brother, who's going to be a stud, and he looks over, and it looks like his face looked like claymation was melting. Was like, ah, you know what I mean? So I get all choked up. Jesus walks up here and he's deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Jesus goes to the deepest parts of our pain. He'll never avoid it. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the shortest verse in the whole Bible, verse 35, Jesus wept. If you haven't memorized this one, you need to, you need to memorize this one. One, because I think you can handle it. And two, it tells us a lot about the humanity of Jesus. You see, strength is not withholding emotion. I don't know who the dumb person is that somehow equated strength with withholding emotion. Jesus is the strongest man who has ever lived. He's going to carry the weight of the sin of the world, and yet in this, mo in this moment, he weeps. You ever go to a funeral and people say dumb stuff to you? Christians have this gift of just saying the dumbest things, don't they? Why are we crying? They're in a better place. I'm going to send you to a better place. Won't you shut up? That's my grandma. That's my best friend. I'm sad. In fact, we had this lady at our church. She lost her father unexpectedly. And she used to attend another church, and you'll hear why. When her father passed away, the pastors from that other church came to visit her. She called me afterwards and said, Pastor, these pastors came and, and questioned, do I have faith because of the amount of tears that I'm shedding? Man, that's spiritual abuse. Because Jesus shows up and weeps. Listen, tears don't mean you don't trust God. I mean, let, let me give you just a little uh, ministerial advice. Because if you are a believer in Christ, there will be a day that you get called into ministry. Maybe not vocationally, but you'll, you'll show up to a time of pain. And don't think you have to say something awesome. When you try to say something awesome, you usually say something dumb. And the Bible says, careless words stab like a sword. So just show up and shut up. Here's what you can say when people ask, well, why did this happen? Are you, there are theological reasons. I just went over five of them. You just put your arm around somebody and you just show up and you just say, I love you. That's it. The Bible says, weep with those who weep. Yeah, crying is not a sign of weakness. In fact, at our church, we do this um, father-daughter retreat. And man, the dudes in our church, they're tough. They are. A lot of, lot of guns and knives and bald heads and muscles. And if, if, if the UFC had a church division, I feel like we would win. Okay. So. <clears throat> so we do this daddy-daughter thing. It's our, our daughters are like 10, 11, 12 years old. 
we do all this goofy stuff. And then on the last night, we do a, a father-daughter dance. And we get in there, and none of us can dance. The girls are all dancing. The dads, we have to play those songs where they tell you what to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> Left foot stomp. <laughs> Two times. That's what we have to do. Okay, so anyway, when that part's over, we have written these blessings for our daughters. And we sit in front of everybody, knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball. And the dads just bless the daughters with their words. And listen, man, it ain't fair, but this is just true. The words of a father weigh a million pounds. <laughs> And every dad, all tough, and they start reading their thing to their little 10-year-old daughter. They're like, darling, I just want to... And they just lose it. Every single dad, man. And here's the thing. Those, those tears were not a sign of weakness. They were a sign of strength. In fact, if more daughters saw the strength of their dad's tears as they blessed them, they'd probably stop listening to the lies of this world. Amen? Yeah, come on. Come on. Jesus wept. Now, theologically speaking, I've got to ask this, but why are you crying? You know how it ends. Like, I'm, we're fighting a battle that's already won. He already told us, no, 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 no. This does not end in death. So how long, would, how long, wait, 30 minutes, 45 minutes? I don't know, the Bible doesn't say. I don't know what the customary waiting time is to bring a dead person out of the grave. You know? You see, <clears throat> I mean, we sang that song. We know how the story ends. He knows how the story ends, so we shouldn't be worried. I'm a big-time college football fan in the United States. We, well, I like college football. We're Georgia Bulldogs at my house. Go to, oh my gosh, I love you. <laughs> Go dogs. All right? Now, their colors are red and black, which also are the colors of the Bible. So that could be <laughs> black. All right? And what I do is I record all the games. And if we ever lose, I just erase those games. I don't watch those games. <laughs> so according to my DVR, the Georgia Bulldogs have been undefeated since 1980. Now, my daughter, even though she's a cheerleader, doesn't know when football season is. And sometimes in the middle of the summer, I will be watching a football game that happened the, the previous year. And she comes in and she says, Dad, oh, the dogs are playing. I'm like, yeah, baby, come on, sit down. And then we will go behind. We will fumble. The other team will score. And she's like, oh, no, Daddy. And I go, oh, baby, ye of little faith. Just hang in here. The dogs are going to rise again. She's like, how do you know? I'm like, well, it's already happened. I already know the end. And so even though Jesus knows the end, he is weeping. Why is he weeping? Here's why he's weeping. Because seven times in the book of John, he is saying, I am. I am that I am. He is perfectly present in your present moment right now. And he weeps with those who weeps. Listen, man. He hears you. Whatever you're going through right now, he hears you. And even though he knows that he is at work in this thing that causes you to cry for your good and his glory, he is with you, he hears you, he sees you. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Pastor Oney is always a critic. Even Jesus' leadership is, is criticized. Something I learned during COVID is this, no matter what you do as a leader, and I know there's a lot of leaders here, no matter what you do as a leader, it's always three little bears. Some people go, that's not enough. Some people go, that's too much. Then there's some people that go, that's about right. You should roll with it. That's about right, people. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> then Jesus deeply moved again. He came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man. Now, remember the last time we saw her, it says that Martha believed. And so this same Martha who believed, the sister of the dead man said to the Lord, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. The King James says, but Lord, he stinketh. That's what it says. Now, and Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Let me ask you this. Do you believe? Because it's easy to believe in church. It's easy to believe in church. Because I mean, I've been preaching for like 50 minutes right now, and all you believe juices are going, right? But then you get out into the workplace, you get out into the neighborhood, and it's time for you to roll away the stone that the Lord told you to roll away, and you begin to think, oh, that stinks. Like, let me ask you this. If, if true faith isn't merely talk or mental consent, but faith is acting as if you actually believe that God is who he says he is, and he always keeps his promises, let me ask you, what stones has he asked you to roll away? Like maybe he told you to pick up the phone and call that person to begin the hard work of reconciliation. 
And right now, you're like, yep, I know I should. But on Tuesday, you think, I don't know, man. Or maybe it's time to start that ministry that every time you get in here and you think about it and you pray about it, you feel the the nudge of the Spirit of God to start that ministry. But yet, when it's actually time to roll that stone away, you're like, I don't know. Here's what will make you nervous. You know God is first. You know God loves first. You know God went first. You know what you do with your money reveals what's first in your life. And God is calling you to be radically generous. And you know it. And you say, I believe in church. And then you you sit down with your accountant and you're like, I don't know, that that kind of stinks. What is the thing that God is calling you to do? Because here's what's crazy about the miracles in the Bible. Though he needs none of us, he calls us to partner with him for the miraculous. I mean, if nobody rolls the stone away and Jesus brings Lazarus from the dead, he's still going to die in the tomb because he can't get out. If the little boy gives the loaves and fishes, but they don't hand them out, nobody ever experiences the miracle. If, if one of the servants don't dip out the water, turned wine, and take it to the master of ceremonies, we don't know that the miracle has ever happened. Maybe the miracle that you're looking for is on the other side of about five steps of obedience, and those steps of obedience don't even make sense to you right now. He says, roll away that stone. And so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Charles Spurgeon says, if he doesn't call Lazarus' name, he would have emptied the graveyard. Be like a thriller video. <laughs> Spurgeon didn't say thriller. I'm saying thriller. You know what I'm talking about? And the man who had died came out. Church, this is a picture of our salvation. This is a picture of our salvation. Every single one of us, by nature and nurture, are spiritually dead. And Jesus calls our name and calls us to life. Amen. You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't walk into the tomb with a set of prerequisites and say, if you can pull this off, then you can come to life. No, 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 that's a workspace righteousness. The other thing he doesn't do is he doesn't go into the tomb with perfume and spray cologne on the dead body. That's just moralism. You just don't smell as bad while you're dying. No, no, no. He calls his name and Lazarus hears his name and goes from death to life. Let me ask you this, church. Has he ever called your name? Have you been saved? Have you been brought from death to life? I'm not talking about your grandma's salvation. I'm not talking about your parents' salvation. I'm not talking about how long you have been in church. Have you ever heard Jesus call your name? And you may say to me, Pastor, what do you mean? Audibly? No, 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 no. Way louder than audibly. Like deep down in your soul where you can hear the whispers of eternity. Have you ever heard him call your name? And the man who died came out. And his hands and his feet were bound in linen strips, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The New International Version says it this way, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let me ask you this. What kind of grave clothes do you need to take off? Now notice, notice, rooted fellowship. He couldn't take the grave grave clothes off on his own. He needed help. He needed friends. He needed brothers and sisters around him to help take off the grave clothes. Why in the world is the first commandment that you take off your grave clothes? Here's why. Because he's alive. And living people don't wear dead people clothes. Listen, when it comes to sin and sinfulness in your life, how silly would it be if you walked up to Lazarus six weeks later and he had his grave clothes on? You'd be like, bro, you stink. What are you doing? Why are you wearing a dead man's clothes? Because you're not dead anymore. And here's what I mean. You don't have to do the things you used to do because you're not the person you used to be. The old you is dead. And now we get to walk in a newness of life. It's like the, it's like the man that was <clears throat> healed. He was crippled. And Jesus says to him, take up your mat and walk. If three weeks later you came up to him and he was laying back down in that nasty mat, you'd say, bro, why are you lying on the mat? Use your legs and walk. That mat doesn't define you anymore. So let me ask you, what grave clothes do you need to take off? We have to quit thinking about sin as good and bad, right and wrong. Those things are true. It's just not enough to sustain you. You got to think about them as life and death. That we have an enemy that only wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And every single time we reject God and go opposite of him, it only leads to death and destruction. 
And every single time we hear the voice of the good shepherd call us and we walk in the direction that he is calling us to, it only leads to life and life abundantly, especially when we don't understand. And so let me ask you this. So do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe that by the help of the Holy Spirit, if you trust Christ as your Savior, that He can help you take off all of those things that this world wants to put on you and instead put on His robe of righteousness and walk in Him? Do you believe? And maybe for some of you, maybe, do you believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that it counted for you? Maybe you don't have the language to fully understand substitutionary atonement. You know what? Neither did the disciples. They simply believed that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. They simply believed or trusted when Jesus said, it is finished, somehow that counted for me. When I was a teenager at this little camp, by nothing that I had done, they reenacted the crucifixion scene of Christ. And listen, where I'm from, everybody believes in God. But the Bible says even the demons believe, but they shudder. But I had never trusted him as my Lord and Savior. They reenacted the crucifixion of Christ. And I saw Jesus push up on his nail-pierced feet and say, it is finished. And somehow, I heard him call my name. For the very first time, I heard him call my name. And I believe that somehow that counted for me. So we're going to respond. Because the gospel demands response. We're going to sing. We need to sing like saved people. This needs to look like Simon the leper's house where out of an overflow of gratitude, we make much of Jesus and we don't care what anybody around us thinks about it. Some of you, some of you are just like married right now. Your question is, Lord, if you'd have been here, Lord, what are you doing? And I think it's great that you guys have a, a place for this. And maybe the thing, maybe the way that you need to respond is sprint down to the front, get on your face at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. And some of you, for the very first time, need to hear the voice of Jesus call you from death to life. And that you admit it. I'm not just a mistaker that needs to try harder. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe that when Christ died on the cross, somehow that counted for me. And in this moment, I am ready to confess him for the first time as my Lord and Savior. So that's what we're going to do. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And I don't know how you typically do it here, but if you, for the very first time, know that when Christ died on the cross, that it counted for you. And today, for the very first time, deep down in the deepest places of your soul, you have heard Jesus call your name, calling you from death to life. And you admit it. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And today, I am confessing Christ is my Lord. And I would ask you right where you are to lift your hand as high as you can. Not because a hand raised saves you, but Christ's death and resurrection does. But you confess to him, Jesus, I am crying out to you. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, we love you more than anything because you first loved us. And Lord, I thank you that you meet us right where we are. So Lord, for those that are just overwhelmed with your blessings. God, I just pray that we would lift our voices as high as we could and we would praise the one who has already fought the battle and we know how this story ends, God. Lord, for those whose circumstances seem out of control, Lord, I pray that like Mary, like Martha, they would run to you. They'd fall on their face at your feet. They would pour out their heart and soul knowing, God, your word says you catch our tears in a bottle. And Lord, I pray the Prince of Peace would meet us right where we are, that you would give us this peace that transcends understanding. And Lord, I pray that when we walk out of this place, you would give us the faith to believe and to roll away whatever stone it is that you have called us to roll away. God, we know that you love us because of the cross. And it's by that power that we pray. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people say Amen.